so Drummond is not speaking. You have me instead, I'm sorry. I will not talk about plasmoids at all or uh, any sorts of weird magnetic field uh, things, so worry not. Uh, instead, I will walk you through um, the theory of windblown bubbles, a thing that has bothered me for a very long time. And uh, now I will hopefully summarize everything, and then everyone will know everything, and then I never have to think about it again. So that'll be very nice. Okay. So what do I mean when I say windblown bubbles, and, and why should you care about them? Basically, I mean if you have the input of a mechanical energy source into some medium, this is very very broad definition that has some sort of constant mechanical energy input rate, some constant uh, mass input rate that's going to, if it's dynamically important, and that's what it should be if you want to care about it, then it will blow a bubble into the surrounding, that's a wind blown bubble. So specifically, I think about stellar winds blown by uh, stellar winds from massive uh, O and B type stars in star forming regions, but you can think about this as coming from AGN winds, from super bubbles, from a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about also applies to jets and even smaller scales. Um, so, and why, why is it interesting to think about these things or why, um, uh, why should we, why should we like look into these things in detail? Well, especially in the context of stellar winds, um, we known for, since sort of the classical model that I'll explain in a second, that these things should be the dominant factor in determining how the efficiency of star formation on the scales of GMCs. But when you measure their effects in actual clouds, uh, observationally, you, it seems to be much, much uh, less important than you would think. And when you include them in simulations, they don't really change anything. So um, why is that? Um, what's, what's going on? So uh, first, I'll explain sort of the, the, the basic sort of theoretical pictures. So this is the, the classical uh, picture that I described a second ago from this Weaver paper from, Weaver paper from uh, I guess, 50 years ago. No, not quite 50 years ago now, almost. Um, you have some constant uh, mechanical luminosity, L, blowing into some background density, rho, uh, and T is your other time parameter. You do some dimensional analysis, you get this. If we want to think about it a little bit more uh, physically, then sort of arbitrarily, if you put in mass and energy, you generically drive sort of a contact discontinuity into the background that's separating what you put in from what was there before. When that, uh, when the momentum of the swept up stuff becomes comparable to the momentum that you're putting in in the first place, you drive a shock backwards. And if that's, if that shock, if that uh, um, expansion forward is happening supersonically in the background medium, then you have a shock forward. So forward shock, backward shock, contact discontinuity. Because this is sort of this perfect, nice dis contact discontinuity, there's no energy transfer across the surface. Energy just builds up in the interior, and it's very efficient at blowing apart the cloud very, very quickly. Uh, one way to change this picture, when, when people first started thinking that this was not representative of what was actually going on, including Mordecai, um, is uh, when you have, when you do account for the evaporative mass flow off of this surface, this perfect contact discontinuity, then you get the interior high enough density that it starts to cool. And when it cools very efficiently, basically you can't support the shocked gas anymore. It just flies forward and this, you go from this energy driven picture to this momentum driven picture. And that makes winds much, much less efficient. Unfortunately, for like normal uh, studies of these of these bubbles, this happens way, way, for stellar winds at least, this happens very, way too slowly to really affect stellar winds over the time scales that they should be relevant. So you need something else. Um, one other way is uh, to uh, just say these winds are bad at blowing apart the cloud that they're living in because they're just leaking out everywhere. They can't actually push on their surroundings because the hot gas just goes through holes and flies off to infinity. That was sort of tackled in this Harper, Clark, and Murray paper uh, in 2009, which basically parameterized this with some covering fraction. And you can uh, basically change this covering fraction, CF, as a free parameter and get you know, a, a reasonable model that matches some, some of the observations. So that's, that's one picture, and that's still definitely part of the realistic picture 
of how winds form, you will leak through holes in some cloud, right? But um, there is also uh, sort of taking the models of, uh, of, of mixing and, and uh, cooling that has been developed in recent years, we can sort of also say, well, if we actually treat this, the expansion of this bubble into a realistic, messy background medium, then you won't have this perfect contact discontinuity that's separating this really hot, high energy gas from this cold gas that when you mix them, you can get intermediate temperature gas that can cool very efficiently. So what if we replace this uh, sort of contact discontinuity with this turbulent radiative mixing layer that has structure on lots of different scales? Um, and let's just say that we can, that results in cooling, so one picture, one version of that, is that that results in cooling that's efficient enough that you go to the momentum-driven picture uh, like, like I was just describing before. So now it's not cooling that's happening in the inside because you've mass-loaded the bubble, but it's cooling that's happening at the interior or at this uh, edge that's happening fast enough that you enter this momentum-driven picture. Okay, so that's just this sort of pure, efficiently cooled version of this, this uh, mixing picture. So... Um, in my thesis, I ran a lot of uh, simulations about uh, of this process. I'm going to show you one of them here. Basically, we just set up a turbulent box, um, and these are uh, sort of parameters that are relevant for a GMC in like a typical Milky Way GMC. I'm showing the density, gas pressure. This is the cooling rate density, and then this will show you the fraction of gas that's in wind material. This is a slice through a 3D simulation, 2D slice through a 3D simulation, if it plays. And we see, so you see some of this really, really messy uh, background structure that this uh, bubble is expanding into. You have lots and lots of cooling happening at the interface between the hot gas and the, and the surrounding gas that results in this uh, very, very rapid cooling. And you can tell, if you've thought about this a lot, the fact that the shock, the shock backwards into the hot medium, is moved forward a lot is a sign that this cooling is very dynamically important. It's changing the evolution of the bubble. But rather than uh, sort of let you take that for granted, okay, well, first I'll show you the, the, the sort of really complicated, this is a 3D um, rendering of that surface. So this is the isotemperature surface of that bubble in three dimensions. It's really, really complicated. Lots of structure on lots of different uh, scales. So um, to show you quantitatively what the dynamics is doing here, I'm showing you the total radial momentum carried that, by that bubble as a function of time. Uh, basically, the different lines here are different wind luminosities, how strong that uh, wind is at blowing into its surroundings. And the black lines that I'm drawing here are what would happen if that, what you would expect if the wind was purely momentum driven, if it didn't have any enhancement in its momentum. So that equation I've written in the top right is sort of what you would expect for a momentum-driven solution where that alpha p, which I'll call the momentum enhancement factor, is constant, okay? If that's constant in time, this is a momentum-driven solution. And you can see here that that's basically true, that's the, that alpha p is basically one. That's because all of these lines are very close to these black lines. And in also that this seems very well converged, so that you can't really see it on this plot, but I, eat, I have three different resolutions for each of these all plotted on top of each other. So this all seems very well converged. I'll come back, uh, come back to this in a second, but it is sort of a, a mystery um, because all of this depends on a lot of dissipative physics. It is a mystery not just here, but also in a lot of the turbulent radiative mixing layer uh, theory and simulation, that when you aren't necessarily resolving the, the right physical scales for dissipation, you still get the same amount of cooling that's going on. And that seems to be what's happening here, the fact that all of these lines lie on almost on top of each other. So um, in that work, we basically wanted to say, okay, we're doing all of this Efficient cooling, is it feasible that we're doing all of that efficient cooling? Can we measure uh, sort of the turbulence, what we would expect? And then we sort of compared it to the turbulent radiative mixing layer theory. Basically, what happens is that this, replacing that contact discontinuity with this turbulent radiative mixing layer, it changes the boundary condition uh, 
on the flow interior to the bubble, which changes how all the dynamics work. So this is sort of that effective uh, velocity that acts uh, as sort of your new boundary condition on that surface. There's some, this is the mixing velocity at the small scales, but you've also enhanced the surface area over which this uh, mixing is happening. So you need both sort of the small scale turbulent mixing, which has to do with when the turbulent eddy turnover time is equal to the cooling time on this cooling length scale. And you also enhance the surface area over which this interaction is happening, and that's accounted for here by this fractal model, okay? What I want to emphasize that this, is that this is sort of small-scale dissipation and large-scale geometry of the bubble, the two things that are coming in to, to play here. I'm emphasizing that because I'm going to confusingly rewrite how I'm writing this in, in a minute. So emphasize this is how it's written now. Um, what happens when you compare, uh, you, you're basically saying that is your new boundary condition. And you can go into the simulations and say, does that actually act as if I measure the turbulence, I measure the fractal dimension of the bubble, and I measure the velocity of the gas, do all of these things, uh, or do all of these things match up within some sort of constant factor? And they do. This is what I'm showing you here for, again, different wind luminosities, different strengths. This effective boundary condition is basically acting as the, the velocity of the gas at the, at the same as the velocity of gas that's coming into the surface. So that all holds together. Um, what was in a lot of that work, which wasn't emphasized very strongly, is that when that acts as a new boundary condition, it actually gives you a prediction for what the momentum enhancement factor should be. So if you know it, it's just some this and some basic math, that you can derive what, how, how much more momentum you should get out of this bubble based just on what this new velocity boundary condition is. Um, and uh, this is where I'm gonna change the way that I'm looking at things to sort of emphasize again the difference between dissipation, small scale dissipation and large scale geometry. So uh, I'm going to rewrite that equation, alpha p equation that I just had by taking the effective mixing velocity and sort of splitting it into these two things. So this V out now plays the, scale, the, the role that's the small scale dissipation. And this sort of ratio of the bubble's surface area to its surface area, if it was a sphere, is playing the role of this sort of geometric, uh, this fractal model. So this is, what, what this is doing is basically just saying, here's like a much more general model for what these two things are, dissipation and geometry. Okay, and then this is how you change that uh, um, alpha p momentum, uh, momentum equation. And what I should say is that what I've shown is that this is basically momentum driven. This alpha p is basically constant, but if you take this at face value, that's not true. The fact that this is momentum driven, that this alpha p is constant, is that these things have to account for one another, okay? The only reason that alpha p is constant in time is that these things scale exactly proportional or different, differently to uh, one another. Um, in fact, if you put in what the actual momentum should be from the equation, you uh, basically take that uh, equation before and put in this p dot w, then you get it directly depending on L winds, the mechanical luminosity, so in like a, in a hardcore sort of theorist naming things sort of sense, this is an energy driven solution. And I can show that explicitly in the simulations by running wind bubbles that have different momentum input rates, but the same energy input rate. And this is what you would expect to get if they had an alpha p equal to one, but this is what you get in both of the simulations. They have the same total momentum carried by the bubble, even though they're drastically different uh, input momenta. Okay. So what does this all mean? Um, so I remember I showed you before this thing showing beautiful convergence between all of these different uh, simulations over uh, a large range of scales. If you actually look, zoom in to one of those simulations, um, so at a given wind luminosity, unfortunately, uh, you see, and this may look very fine and normal to you, depending on how, how annoyed you are by numerical effects, 
What I'm showing you here is simulations run with both uh, Hydro, which is basically what I showed you before. MHD is just with a background MHD field. Um, and then three different resolutions. So the darker is higher resolution. And you can see here that there is some resolution dependence, but more concerning is that the resolution dependence is opposite between, or the, res the resolution convergence uh, condition sort of is different between the MHD and the Hydro. Okay, you go to higher resolution in MHD, you get more momentum. You go to higher resolution in Hydro, you get less momentum. And the, what I'm going to show you, but may not have too much time to get into all the details of, but please uh, ask me it and we can talk about it at, at length, is that this is because of the difference between the scaling of dissipation and the scaling of geometry between the MHD and the hydro simulations. So uh, in particular, um, I, yeah, yeah. Let me, so what I'm showing in each of these, this is pressure versus the, this is tiny, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the sphere equivalent radius, or the sphere equivalent area of the bubble, okay? Basically, further to the up and right in here is more momentum out of your bubble, and this is less momentum out of your bubble, the same line styles that I just showed before. In hydro, you go to higher resolution, you get less momentum. In MHD, you go to higher resolution, you get more momentum. And that's because the surface area of the geometry of the MHD bubble is uh, increases less when you go to higher resolution and uh, than the than the hydrodynamic bubble does, and that's because it is it the smaller scale structure is suppressed. Um, this dissipation, I'll come back to it in a second. It basically acts acts similarly between these two. Um, so I can model, I, I sort of put in this way more, the more general version of uh, the geometry of these bubbles, but let me again return to the fractal model and just say it's a fractal. In the hydrodynamic uh, picture, these are the, the blue bubbles, you can try and measure the fractal dimension in several different ways. And that's what I'm doing in this plot, which I can't get into uh, all of them, but basically, what I'm showing is the, uh, a measure of the surface area of the bubble as a function of its radius. And if you just say that one measure of that is the, the logarithmic derivative of the surface area of the bubble with respect to its radius, so the log derivative of this is a measure of the fractal dimension, then all of the simulations sort of match up around one half for the hydro picture. And in the MHD picture, there, it's much reduced. You have a much less uh, smaller fractal dimension, which means it's a much smoother bubble. Um, you can see that the MHD simulations fall below this line at later times, and if you measure the fractal dimension in a different way, that is consistent with the hydro is basically a half through the whole simulation, and MHD, you decrease the fractal dimension of these bubbles as you go forward in time. Um, this is showing, this basically holds the same way in the uh, uh, hydro in the MHD picture as it does here in the hydro picture, but what this is showing is this small scale uh, dissipation velocity um, as you go to higher resolution, how it depends uh, on uh, basically the resolution and the bubble radius. This is an effective fit that I basically just fit by, by eye to this. There's a lot uh, that I could go into as to how this is set, and I would love to go into, but it would take far too long. It's most of what has bothered me about this for the past year and a half. Um, but basically, if you just put all of that stuff in to this prediction for what the momentum enhancement should be in these simulations, it perfectly explains what we see in the convergence behavior of the simulations, that in the hydrodynamic picture, you have uh, basically a constant momentum input rate, and in the MHD picture, you have more and more momentum at later times, and you get more and more momentum at lower resolution. Um, so, explains this picture. Um, I, this is a lot of math, but I'm basically just saying, what happens if you take that equation and you put in realistic values? Like, I've talked to all of this uh, game about, like, this is the effects of numerics, but we want to know what actually happens in reality. And if you put in reasonable things for what the turbulent diffusivity should be and what the fractal geometry should be, so this is about the turbulent cascade and the fractal dimension, you get a momentum-driven solution uh, in the end. Uh, so 
sad, but, well, not sad. I mean, that's great. It, it means, that basically, what I want to show you here is that this other picture that we had is still very consistent with what we were saying before. You still do lose a lot more energy as you go forward in time, basically because of the same uh, uh, mechanisms that I was talking about at the beginning. So um, the, the problem, so my main takeaways is that the, you do need to resolve the, turbulent, the actual dissipative scales for these problems, and I can get into all the details of uh, how that changes things. Um, uh, and the reason that this looks nearly resolved in uh, these simulations, as well as I think the turbulent radiative mixing layer simulations, is that this is a, a somewhat of a um, coincidence of scalings. You, when you don't resolve the right dissipative scales, it just so happens that your fractal scaling of the area of this surface is exactly compensated for by the dissipative scaling at higher resolution. So you still get the same answer, even if it's not necessarily being faithful to the, re representing the, the right physics. Um, but that doesn't mean that this efficient cooling picture that I laid out in the beginning is unrealistic. So I'll uh, leave it there and take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, question? Uh, yes. yes. Great talk. Um, so I'm just wondering, are you doing ILES or DNS? ILES. Yeah. So what does it mean to resolve the dissipation scale in an ILES? Because the dissipation scale is just set by the grid, mm -hmm. and it just moves as you go to higher and higher grid resolution. Yes. So um, w great question. Um, what I mean by that here is basically resolving that cooling length. Okay. And the thought behind that is that if you resolve the cooling length of the turbulence, then you've gotten to the point of feeding of energy into the smaller, cast, smaller scale cascade. And what will happen on the unresolved scales is that you'll drastically enhance the area of that surface until uh, the point where physical uh, conduction will, will take place and sort of just make everything the same temperature. But resolving that smaller scale process isn't important as long as you're capturing the turbulent sort of mixing. Okay, like that, that makes that sense. Yeah. Have you um, thought about doing a DNS to see if you can see, see how things change when you actually control the viscosity and resistivity? Yes. So, oh. There we go. No. So, um, in terms of the overall bubble, um, pretty much un infeasible um, because the, what I'm showing you here is the field length. Uh, as a function of pressure um, compared to the radius of the bubble. These are the pressures that I want to resolve for sort of these simulations, the range of pressures. That's my highest resolution simulation is the black line. So you're maybe four orders of magnitude off from the, the real field length um, in these simulations. That said, uh, in Turbulent radiative mixing layer simulations, Drummond and I have started running DNS uh, simulations to sort of uh, quantify that the, exactly the picture that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think yeah. it's about doing a controlled experiment more yeah. than, you know, being able to resolve every single scale. Yes. yes Cheers, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yes, yeah, fair. It's like you read our mind. Yeah. Um, uh, question. So, it's pretty cool to see the area or like the, the, the magnetized bubble uh, fractal dimension decreasing with time. Is this like a small scale dynamo in action at the interface? Have you looked at like beta in the interface or something over over time? Um, I don't know if the, so I think what it is is basically the, uh, with, with bubbles you have magnetic draping, so when you expand into the surrounding medium you sweep up all of the magnetic field that was there in the surrounding. Eventually, that that becomes that magnetic field becomes dynamically important, and it's now you have this over magnetized shell that is like super stable to all of the small scale instabilities, and basically the only sort of fractal scaling that you can get is uh, the background structure that you had there in the first place. Everything else is basically stable. Um, I forgot to mention Vishniak instabilities. Sorry, uh, <laughs> which are, of course, it's basically the the Vishniak instabilities that you, the thin shell instabilities that you would have if it weren't for the magnetic field are supported because the magnetic field acts as a thick shell. 
I had a couple of sort of one observation, two observation-based questions. One is, do you get a reasonable relationship between the sort of effective radius, in some sense, and the time over which you've done the simulation? Because you can compare that to observations. Yes. And then the next thing is the X-ray luminosities that you get out of your boxes. They look like the ones that you see. Yeah. And the other thing is, I noticed, at least in the sims, if you go look at the picture that people have already shown you a few times of Ada Carina, not Ada Carina, but the Carina Nebula, there's all kinds of internal structure inside the bubble, which I didn't see in yours. And I actually had somebody count up a bunch of those things. There's a hell of a lot of area in these little clumps inside of the nebula, which may be comparable to bigger than the area on the edges, at least as best we could tell by eye. Well, okay. There were multiple questions. The first question, radius versus time, is that reasonable? Yeah. If you use an efficiently cooled model to predict sort of what are the lifetimes of clouds or the radius versus time relationship, you get much better agreement than you would in the weaker picture or energy conserving picture. Not to say that leaking of hot gas material is unimportant or anything. It's just that you can also do it with this sort of picture. Second question is x-rays, right? So you don't necessarily get, so this, you don't get the enough x-ray emission in these ILES simulations because for a number of reasons. One thing is that, and I think this is an underappreciated fact that I've talked with Mordecai a little bit about, but even in the Weaver bubble or in the Weaver solution, most of the x-ray emission in most of the observational bands that we look at comes from the interface between the hot gas and the surrounding. So if you are not resolving how dissipation works at that interface, then you are not resolving the right phase structure that's important for the x-ray emission. In general, when you don't include Spitzer conductivity, you don't have mass loading of these bubbles, even if there is mixing. So you don't have enough x-ray emission in the hot gas for these simulations. So I was going to ask that. So you're saying you don't currently include the Spitzer conductivity? No. Yeah. But I plan to. But the thing is that you won't, you can do that and it will help get to the mass loading, but it won't, you won't resolve the real, the actual. Yeah. I understand that. So Dimitri, could you come to set up? And Christopher. Yeah. Oops. So I think it would be interesting to measure the properties of the post-shock or of the gas that you get when this bubble runs over this pre-structured medium. For instance, what are the turbulent properties in that medium? And I think you've looked at some of that stuff, but maybe like what's the Mach number, what's the velocity dispersion, what's the density fluctuations? And from that one could then actually also infer what's the driving mode of turbulence. Yeah. Well, I put in all the turbulence by hand, so I have all of that stuff. But that's in your pre-structured medium, right? The question is like after the wind runs over this material, what kind of turbulence is driven, say, how much solenoidal or compressive velocity modes do you have? Or can you even say what type of turbulence this effect? Yeah. What a wind, basically, what kind of driver this is. One problem that is a good point, and one problem with that is that the shells are so thin in these hydrodynamic simulations that you're not, you don't have a lot of room in like gas that's been affected by the bubble that isn't part of the bubble, which would be the gas you'd be interested in for that. But it is more resolved in sort of simulations that I have with photoionization feedback where the shell is thicker. But yeah, I should. Some ideas of how to separate that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.